Well, hello, US2 family. I am going to tell you right now, this was one of my most favorite, most soulful, inspiring, empowering conversations I have had in my my five years of, of birthing this podcast. Um, it is such an honor to bring back Greg Braden. I've had him here on the show a few times. He will be back again in 2024. He has really just become such a, a mentor, a guide, a dear friend, a complete uh, luminary and incredible person who really knows the science, the 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 with backing and the spirituality and the heart behind ways that we can evolve as a species, as as humanity, that we the way we can evolve our consciousness, our our entire way of existing, our reclaiming our sovereignty, our divinity. We talked a lot. And I'm I'm actually sharing this intro after the conversation because I just wanted to get right into it with him. It was just such a gift to bring him back. He's about to travel for the rest of the year. And uh, it's a real gift and honor, my friend, to be here today with you and to be together with uh, Greg. So let me share with you in case you are new here or new to Greg Braden, let me share a little bit about his background. And then I'm going to just bring you right into the conversation because it was just, it was incredible. It was extraordinary. And uh, I'm honored you're here with me. And uh, as always, I'm just sending you so much love. I really appreciate and acknowledge you for being here, for 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 being your USG, your, you know, really connecting to your soul self, your higher self, the divinity within you. And so um, let me share about Greg and we will get started. Greg Braden is a five-time New York Times bestselling author. He's a scientist, international educator, and renowned as a pioneer in the emerging paradigm based in science, social policy, and human potential. From 1979 to 1991, Greg worked as a problem solver during times of crisis for Fortune 500 companies, including Cisco Systems, where he became the first technical operations manager in 1991. He continues today to be all about problem solving as he works. His work reveals deep, deep insights into the new human story and how these discoveries inform the policies of everyday life and the emerging world. To date, his research has led him to 15 film credits and 12 award-winning books now published in over 40 languages. Some of my most favorite of his books, The Divine Matrix, um, The Wisdom Codes. He's also got, there's another book, um, if I can remember, oh, The uh, God Code. He's got so many beautiful books. Highly recommend you check them out. Greg is the proud recipient of numer numerous awards, including the Walden Award for New Thought, the Illuminate Award for Conscious Visionaries. Um, I was uh, part of that experience with him. And uh, in he is listed in the United Kingdom's Watkins Journal among the top 100 of the world's most spiritually influential people uh, living for the seventh conse consecutive year. So you are in the presence of a beautiful soul, a beautiful human being that really is all about heart and love and evolution to the highest level, uh, where we are focused on being more loving, more kind, more compassionate, where we embrace our divinity. And he's going to tell you all about how to do this from some really cool stories and ways and practices that you may not know. So I will, I will end it here, bring you right into our conversation. And as always, my friend, thank you for being here on this journey together, being your USU. I love you. And here we go. This episode is being sponsored by Lumen. I love my Lumen. It is like my best friend. It tracks your metabolism. So if you have any health issues like an autoimmune condition or you're going through menopause or you're just trying to release whatever weight isn't serving you, Lumen can be your best friend. I've been using it for over a year. It tracks what you're eating, your movement, most importantly, your metabolism. Just go to Lumen. Dot me and use the code USU to get $50 off. USU family. Oh my goodness. Okay. So 
you know, I want to tell you something. I am always grateful to be in your earbuds to be here with you. Today is just such a special day. I cannot even tell you the honor it is to have our amazing guest back, Greg Braden, one of my most favorite people on the planet. I think he knows this. He is one of the wisest, heart-centered human beings I know and makes me want to cry. I am so grateful, Greg, to have you back. This is such a gift. Wow, I'm like literally feeling tears. I just, you, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being here. We're going to dive in and I'm just, thank you for making the the time and your gracious, heart-centered energy and wisdom. Julie, thank you so much. Thank you for those. I, I'm a Cancerian male, and if I cry, my voice will change, and, and it messes up the whole interview. So what I will say is this, this is a media day for me. So I, I start the morning, and I have back-to-back -back interviews, and I wish I had started with yours with those beautiful words and that warm mm -hmm. welcome to launch me into my day. Uh, feelings mutual, and I, you know this is completely unscripted. We have no idea what we're going to talk about. So I want to thank you for your trust in sharing mm -hmm. me with your your community. But, you know, I think your community is my family as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, I'm honored to share this virtual stage with you. And, you know, there's so many places that we could go, so many things that we could touch upon today. And I'm going to I'm going to trust. I said off off camera, this is a dance and I'm really happy for the lady to lead. So I'm going to follow <laughs> your lead in this dance. So let's let's see where we go. Oh, I love it. Well, I'm actually going to do something I haven't really done. I usually do this off camera, but I'm actually going to just take a beat. I'm going to close my eyes and ask the divine, the divine matrix, the divine to just inspire me, us, this conversation and tap into the greater consciousness of everyone listening. May this, I know this conversation will bless all and uplift all. And because uh, there's so many areas I could go in with you and I'm just going to be asked to be guided and... Um, feeling very, very thankful to be here with you. All right. So what's coming to me, we're just going to let, I love, I love, this is my favorite kind of conversation where we're like, I don't know, who knows? We'll see where we go. We're just going to, we're going to go. I do think the first area that I just, I want to talk about this whole realm of consciousness and potentiality. And to kind of break it down, I think it can feel overwhelming. I think that it can also for, I know because I get comments about this, like, all right, how do I even like, how do we know? Are there any signs that consciousness is shifting in the planet? How do I do this on my own? Like, what, what are, what are you seeing? What are you, I know you're an expert in this. And you can start anywhere you want. I'm going to just open with a big old question about consciousness and the shift on our globe and potentiality, Greg, and let you have a party. <laughs> well, thank you, Julie. You know, I'm a student just like you, and I'm, I'm always learning. I'm, I think I'm a good listener, and I have made a conscious effort to become a better listener because there's a world speaking to us right now. There's a world speaking to us about what it is that's happening, and I'm I'm just going to say to, to our viewers, you know, it's, it's no secret that we're living a time of extremes. I mean, that can't be a secret to anyone from climate change to social change to buckling and collapsing financial systems. And, you know, the, the, the wars, 22 wars are being waged on our planet right now. We hear about one or two in the media. 22 wars are happening right now. This isn't business as usual. And, it is difficult sometimes to to stay uh, to stay focused on our lives. It's difficult to stay optimistic sometimes. And uh, I want to just just share a story. Can I, can I share a story? A quick story. Oh my gosh, you have free reign. Absolutely. Ooh. I was on a plane uh, not long ago between Atlanta, Georgia, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. I call them the A A cities. They're you know they both start with A. And it was about a three hour flight, and I sat next to an Air Force cadet. Uh, he was young, and he just got married, and we were talking about the world. And he told me that he and his wife had chosen to have no children. And I said, why is that? And he says, why would we bring a child into the world, mm. the, the world that we see right now? And he told me all the bad things that are happening through his eyes as a military man. And he's, I said, you know, I completely understand and respect your point of view. And I shared a little bit different point of view. Of, about my sense of this rare and precious moment that we're living right now. And I asked him a question. I said, 
why would you deny a soul the opportunity to come in to the world right now when everything is up for grabs? Everything is being unrooted and one idea from one person has the, the chance to be heard and to be accepted. One idea can change the world in a way now that we, we haven't seen in a very, very long time, certainly not in our lifetimes. And then the plane landed and uh, we were in baggage and he picked up his, his duffel bag and he was like, he didn't even say goodbye. He was running for the door. And I said, hey, aren't you going to say goodbye? And he says, oh yeah. And I said, you're in a big hurry. And he says, are you kidding? After that conversation, I'm going to go home and make a baby. So he said that he, he wanted to bring a child into the world after having that conversation. And, uh, and I said, yeah, good deal. You know, there we go. One, one more, <laughs> one more new life into the world. <clears throat> and and it's, it is, it's all about perspective. Uh, we, my experience, my understanding, this is the 43rd year I've done this work in, in one form or another. And I've been blessed mm. to travel into some of the most remote, isolated, pristine, magnificent, beautiful places remaining in the world today, archaeological sites of, of temples and, uh, and the remains of ancient civilizations to understand what it is that they knew that we may have forgotten or maybe we never knew about our time. And I used to think it was for, for the temples and for, for the archaeology. And what I discovered, Julie, very quickly is it was more about the people, the indigenous people that preserve that wisdom, that still live at those places. Mm -hmm. And meeting with them and their perspective, and, and they have always said that we would live this time in history where we would live a, a, a time of the convergence of cycles that would change our planet. They said, you won't recognize your nations. You won't recognize your borders. You won't recognize your own neighborhood. You won't recognize your life. And they've said that for over 40 years. 1986 was the first trip that I made. And, and largely, those ideas have been discounted until recently. I was doing a radio interview with a New York uh, DJ who I inter interviewed with in 2012, the craziness around 2012. And in 2012, he said, oh, yeah, you know, 2012, when are all these changes you're talking about going to happen? And then I interviewed with him earlier this year or late last year. And he said, yeah, he said, when are these changes going to stop? So he's he's acknowledging that we are you know, living this this very unique time. So for me, uh, there are so many layers that we can go into about what is happening and, and what's changing. And. And, you know, we can talk about climate change, social change, financial change. We can talk all those things, and they're important. And they need to be discussed with kindness so that we can find resolution. But ultimately, Julie, ultimately, on a deep level, there is a battle that is playing out for our thoughts, for our beliefs, what we believe to be true about ourselves and our world and where we come from. There's a battle for our very humanness. Our very humanness is on the line because there are proposals to replace our natural biology with synthetic technology, with chips in the brain, sensors under the skin, chemicals in, in the blood. And the reason that this is important is because it reveals the deepest battle of all. This will answer the question about consciousness. Mm. It is through our humanness that we have access to what I'll call our divinity. And then I'll, I'll define this. The divine nature of what it means to be human. Now, a lot of people, when I say this in a live audience, they think we're talking about religion because divinity has been linked with religion. But if you look at the definition, this is fascinating. Divinity has nothing to do with religion. What the definition is, divinity is our ability to transcend perceived human limitations, not just to survive, but to, to transcend, to thrive in the presence of the limits. And they may not even be real, perceived. They're the limitations that we've been programmed to accept about our abilities, our, our limited abilities, or our powerlessness. So divinity is about accessing that part of ourself that often is veiled by the fear of all of the extremes I'm talking about. So we can focus, you know, spend your life focusing on climate change or on collapsing financial and economic systems. It's all important. 
on society, on social, on politics. It's all important. However, ultimately, those are the diversions that keep us from accessing, I think, the real goal of what this time in our lives is all about. And it's our ability to become, maybe for the first time, fully human. We mm -hmm. may not even know what it means to be fully human in our lives because at least three generations now, we've been told, and we're still teaching our kids this in, in school today, we've been told that bi biology, our carbon biology is flawed, that we are flawed by our very nature. And among those flaws are emotion, human emotion, they say, when they teach this in the, in the schools. And there are scientists that, that believe this. Human emotion clouds our ability to think clearly and to make good decisions. They say that human intimacy, the intimacy between a man and a woman that, that creates a new life is imperfect because you never know the outcome. And mm. you don't know what, what that child is, is going to be like. Eye color, hair color, fast twitch muscles for athletics or, or IQ. You mm. don't know any of that. So here's, here's where I'm going with this. We've been conditioned to believe that we are powerless victims and as victims that we need a savior and our savior is being touted as technology. So technology is being dangled out there to entice us to replace our humanness with computer chips in the brain, uh, chemicals in, in the body, sensors under the skin, AI, artificial intelligence. And this is where science and consciousness are really coming together in a very interesting way, because to have artificial intelligence, we have to define what is consciousness. What is intelligence? What is sentience? What are, is AI a sentient form of life? We've got to define all of those things. So what's happening, Julie, is we're in the process of this tremendous shift on the planet and in our lives, in the midst of that process, we are developing these technologies and we cannot complete that development until we understand ourselves. To understand, if we want to, to build real AI, not, and I'll define what I mean by that in just a minute, but if we want to build yeah. actual intelligence and not just a program that mimics some predetermined answers, if we want actual intelligence, we can't do that until we understand our consciousness, our intelligence. And this is, uh, divinity plays a very powerful role in this. Divinity, our ability to transcend perceived human limitations. This is the part of us that's ageless, it's timeless. Mm -hmm. We all have divinity. Sometimes we veil that divinity uh, from our, our access. We do it in one of three ways. We can deny our own divinity. We can, certainly, we have free will. We can deny that we are anything special. And there's people, I know people in my family that, that do that, in my community. That's number one. Number two, we can be conditioned out of our divinity by our family, by society, uh, by mainstream media, by what we teach in the classroom the way we think about ourselves, we can be conditioned to, to deny our divinity. Uh, and number three, through technology, when we replace our natural biology with synthetics, synthetic tissue, synthetic, uh, you know, and I, I just want to be clear, there are times when we need maybe an artificial heart or an artificial kidney or an artificial hip or a knee. And that's not what I'm talking about. There is a movement to replace our entire bodies mm. with synthetic material uh, and preserve only the, the brain for immortality. That is a movement that is afoot right now. Mm. Here's why this is a problem. It is the DNA in our bodies, the, the unique formula of DNA in our bodies that is the antenna that tunes us to our divinity in the field. The divinity isn't in here, we access that divinity through the gift of the biology that we were given when we appeared 200,000 years ago. You take away the DNA or you alter the DNA, and there are attempts to do that as well, and we no longer, it's like turning the dial on a radio, now you lose the station 
that holds your divinity. So when we give our biology away, when, when we begin to replace our natural abilities with artificial technology, our abilities begin to atrophy. The neurons that we once used may not develop because a chip is doing it for us and the body says you don't need that anymore. So, so all the, there are layers and layers and layers of things happening. Ultimately, I think we are, are being tested. We're being pushed to the edge of who we believe we are <clears throat> in lieu of accessing the deep truth of our existence and what our divinity is really all about. And just to define divinity, I'm, I'm just going to share. Um, I was at the Grammys with Martha. Martha, my wife, is a Grammy. Uh, she's been in the Grammy ballot. She's a, a voting member of the Grammys. And I, I got to accompany her to, to the Grammys a couple of years ago and got to talk to a lot of musicians. Not, not all of them had Grammy awards, but they were all uh, nominated in some way. And every one of them, I asked them a question and everyone answered the question the same way. I said, where did that beautiful music come from? Or the words to that song that just touched my soul so deeply. Where did those words come from? And Julie, every one of them said, it didn't come from me. Mm. They said it came through me from something else. I had to get out of the way to allow this music to come through me or these words, these powerful words to come through me. That's our divinity. Our intuition is an aspect of our divinity, our imagination, our creativity. When we express something deep within us, in this physical realm, and we're reaching to find that something. That, that's our divinity. That's what I'm talking about. And the reason it's important is because when we have a clear connection with our divinity, we are less vulnerable to fear. We are less vulnerable to the fear of the uncertain world that we find ourselves in. It's still out there. It doesn't change the world. It changes the way we respond to the world we are less vulnerable to the fear, and that means we are less vulnerable to the agenda and the ideas that other people have about what our lives should look like and what our world should look like. Another way of saying that is when our divinity is, is veiled, when we feel separate from our divinity, we feel lost mm -hmm. and we feel powerless, and then we become more vulnerable more susceptible to other people's ideas because we are lost. We don't know who we are. So consciousness is what underlies all of this. Consciousness is the fertile field within which our divinity exists. Divinity is, is an aspect of consciousness. Uh, you can think of consciousness as the container and our divinity as a vessel within that container. So where I see things happening, that, that was a long answer to a short question, but what I see happening is that people all over the world, this just isn't in, in America or in, in my community, we are undergoing change faster than we've ever undergone change in a single lifetime. And for some people, uh, it is more change than they can really accept because they've never been given the tools to embrace the resilience of change. And so what, what's happening is it's forcing people to come to a deeper understanding of who they are and what their relationship is with their own bodies when it comes to the immune system, for sure, with, uh, with the people under their roofs that they share everyday life with as belief systems clash over the family dinner table and in the living room, you know, after dinner, share, we share a house, we share blood. Uh, we have, you know, common ancestors, and we could not be thinking more differently. And uh, and that pushes us to come to terms with who we are and what's true in our lives. And then now the whole conversation of AI and the role that we are going to allow AI to play in our society and and in our personal lives. We can't answer that question until we know who we are. How much of ourselves are we going to give away? to the technology? How much of ourselves are we going to give away to AI? We can't answer that until we know who we are and what we're giving away. So I wanted to lay that foundation. It's a long answer to a short question, and it opens the door to a, a lot of directions where we can go in, in our conversation. So th does that make sense, what, what I'm saying?
Oh, yeah. I mean, this, and I want to say, you know, I, I know this community, whoever is listening, first of all, we're going to have all your information. You have so many incredible events where you go into these different aspects deeper. I know this is like, we could do days on this topic. I, I really appreciate the, I love that you dove into the divinity aspect. And to me, what's coming up is really to get how sacred this is, the the fact that we, with the DNA that we have, with the connection that's possible, that we have an ability to connect. I love what you said. I love how you said this, the um, consciousness in the fertile field, um, that the divinity is that fertile field, which our consciousness exists. And I think, you know, for, for, for those listening who are up against you know, what do I believe? And there's fear and fear can be so disempowering. It can affect the immune system. I mean, I, I won't get into my story with it, but I can say that I know as somebody who breathes and lives this, I found myself kind of in this like fear bug, Greg, where I was like, what is happening? I was waking up in the middle of the night, like with fear thoughts, really scared. Um, and I, must say, I feel like anyone listening, anyone here, our family, you, I, like we chose to be here at this time. This is an extraordinary time, as you said. And I think for those listening, you know, just where to start with, I think, because it's that self to symphony, like how do we as individuals, I know anyone listening wants to be their best self, wants to connect with their divinity. I think of that as your USU. Honestly, that's what I mean by that. It's your connection to the divine. It's your intuition. Where do we start, especially, and that's a big question, uh, but health, emotions, programming that we've been subjected to, like I don't, you can just go anywhere you want with that. But I just keep hearing people like, where do I begin, Greg? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a good question. So, so now I'm going to tie back into the foundation that we just created together. Yeah. There is a battle. It's an ancient battle that began the moment humans appeared on this earth. And we all know this. We sense this. There's a fundamental battle between good and evil, between light and dark. And yeah. it has played out over eons in many different ways through society and through technology and the choices that we make, it's, it's playing out right now. And this battle, the way that we win this battle is by not fighting. If we engage in the fight, we succumb to and fall into the ancient trap that keeps us stuck in this battle. The way that you win this battle is by becoming the best version of yourself by accessing and embracing your divinity. And here's the reason, because it is through our divinity that we transcend the fear. If we don't have access to the divine nature of our being, and we don't know, it's what I call a soul compass. If we don't know with rock solid certainty who we are as we walk down the streets on this beautiful planet we live on, if we don't know who we are, it's very easy to succumb to the fear of the uncertainty of incoming. And we are inundated with media. And I have to say, Julie, unfortunately, it's, it's across the board. I used to believe that there were forms of media, PBS, NPR, CNN. I used to think they were more objective, and now I know that's not true. And the reason is because they're different networks, but they are owned by just a handful of corporations that have an agenda. And I have to say that as a scientist, I'm, I'm a degree geologist with a strong background in life sciences, math, physics, computer science, archaeology, and astronomy. And I say that because mm-hmm. it's that multidisciplinary background that allows me to stay current with new discoveries that are being published in these very obscure technical journals. And those discoveries support, the evidence in those discoveries supports what I'm saying is there is a, a movement to feed us information so that we make the choices that direct us to support other people's ideas and other people's agendas. That people want to know more about that. It's actually called fifth generational warfare is, is the term that's used. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not a kinetic war. It's not about what it, it all happens in the mind and the heart. And it's very sophisticated. Uh, and it goes two ways. And the way that we use that is that we become the best version of ourselves. And when we have that, we are no longer bound by the shackles of the fear that keep us 
feeling small and insignificant and powerless victims in the world, it empowers us, it frees us to love. And when we love fearlessly, when we love ourselves without reservation, you know, many people are afraid to fully love themselves because they've been led to believe it's not safe. And if you cannot love yourself fully, it's very difficult then when you reach inside because you have someone else in your life that you truly want to love and you reach inside for the love to give to them. If you don't have it for yourself, your vessel, uh, your vessel is not as full as you'd like for it to be. There are entire teachings about that in, in the ancient traditions. When we embrace our divinity, it frees us to love ourselves and to love others. And in the presence of that love, we are no longer subject to the fear. It doesn't change what's happening. We can watch an economic system collapse. It needs to. It's broken. It's corrupt. We can watch social change because that's where we are right now. And, you know, we can, we can watch all of these things happen. But because our soul compass is strong, we know that we are watching the process rather than victims of the process. Because when you begin to, you know, there, there are places, Julie, where the words fail and people just have to live this truth. When we embrace our divinity, here's what happens. We begin to see the world differently. Now, and I'm going to offer a tool to do this, by the way, before we leave here awesome. today. But when, when we embrace our divinity, we begin to see the world differently. And through that lens, uh, number one, we change the chemistry in our bodies. So then that's important. But it, we, are, uh, we are not frightened by the things that may frighten people around us because we know with absolute certainty who we are in the world. And this is something that's not taught in the schools. We are the product of a, at least three generations of dumbing down our young people. Our, most young people don't have a, an inkling of understanding about their immune system and how it works. They don't have an inkling of understanding about the delicate, highly advanced technological, soft technology that they call their bodies. They've been taught that their bodies are flawed because they are human. And because of that, they lose respect for their bodies and how they treat their bodies, what they put into their bodies are much more willing to imbibe in chemicals and in processes that actually steal life away from them rather than supporting that life because they've never been given a reason not to, Julie. And in that way, the education system has failed for at least three generations, at least three. Uh, and, and because of that, we now have a population global, not just in the West, that has become more vulnerable to other people's ideas, competing ideas, based upon competing agendas, and that makes for a crazy world. It, that, it's a world that looks very crazy. You know, in um, my first public speaking I ever did was at the Open Door Bookstore, 1986, in uh, Denver, Colorado. They just closed right before COVID. They closed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was during that time uh, that a man I admired tremendously uh, was uh, he was still in the world and he passed not long after his name was Buckminster Fuller. And if our viewers don't know who he is, you probably know him because he created the architecture based upon the geodesic dome. That's what most people know. But if you study his life, he was a very deep thinking philosopher, a visionary way ahead of his time. And what he said once, Julie, and, and this has stayed with me all my life. He said, you'll never change the world by fighting against the things you don't like. He said, if you want to change the world, find a new way that makes the old way obsolete and people will follow the new way and the old way falls away. Mm. And I think that's true in our lives right now. If we spend our time fighting against all the things that we don't like, uh, what we're doing is we're actually engaging it and what keeps on a level that keeps us stuck in this ancient battle. The way to win this battle is to find the new way, and people will follow the ways that work better, whether it's new ways of energy, new ways of feeding our families, new ways of society, whatever it is. Find a new way, and the old ways fall away. And, and I think we're seeing this happen in our lives. Now, I'll give you a perfect example is war. Uh, 
the idea of war is, is just horrific. And what we're finding now, I, I mean, what would happen if they throw a war and nobody comes? Like, mm. what if you throw a party and nobody shows up? What if you throw a war and nobody shows up? I have talked to, to young people, military people, who no longer feel good about hurting another person who is not threatening them. It's a very, very different concept. If you're attacked, that's one thing. But to go and to hurt our global family, to hurt our brothers and sisters, there's a reluctance to do that now. I could, I could see a time when young people refuse to fight and we walk away from war as a way to solve our problems. I could see that happening in this lifetime mm. because of, of where I think we're going to get really close to some really dark experiences. And I think we'll have to get close to walk away from it. But that tells me, you asked me in the beginning mm. of this conversation, shifts in consciousness, that wouldn't have happened during World War II, or it wouldn't have happened in the 50s or the 60s or during the Cold War. So I, I'm seeing a, a shift, you know, in, in that way. So we find a new way that makes the old ways obsolete. So where that comes down to a practical reality in our lives today, we are being pushed, and I, I have to use that word, we're not being invited, we're being yeah. pushed into a, a world called a reset, a very different world than what we've lived in the past. And we're being pushed into a world where we live in compact, centralized cities rather than dispersed in rural areas. We're being pushed into centralization of everything from finances, CBDC, centralized digital currencies, to centralized sources of food, centralized sources of energy, centralized sources of banking and finance and living. It, in any time, Julie, that is not a good way to live. In a time of extremes, it's the worst way. The last thing you want is centralization. What we want is what our indigenous ancestors have always taught us, it is localized living, localized living where we have localized sources of food, localized sources of energy that make sense for that locality, localized sources of economy and finance, localized sources of water, not centralized through supply chains that are vulnerable and can break down and hurt many people. When you live locally, you are stronger as an individual and stronger as a community. And through that, you can help other people when they're having problems because you've taken care of yourself in a way that reflects the natural world. Nature is localized. Nature is not centralized. So, so this is one of the places, and, and what I'm saying is in direct opposition to the proposals and in some cases the policies that are putting, being put into place. We're being, I just saw this on, on mainstream. I, I watched a, a YouTube news broadcast. They're telling people that rural living is dangerous because you might see a fire. So you want to leave the rural living and pack yourself into a consolidated city where the fires can't, can't happen. This is a false narrative. And, you know, I, I just want our community to know that it's not about, and I want to be really clear about this. This isn't about making somebody wrong. I don't want to make someone wrong. I love my global family. I love this planet and the people of, of this world. And there are fundamental principles that are at, at work right here that all reflect ideas of, of divinity. And some people would call it spirituality. I think divinity and spirituality are very closely linked. But we know this intuitively. We know that if we, if we are taking our food farm to table from, from a farm less than a mile away, and we've got some kind of a weather event that's going to impact someone, it may not impact us. It's not going to impact everybody at the same time because we are, are doing this. We're living locally. And that's, that's just one, one principle, one principle, living, living locally. So that's in a general sense. When we get to mm -hmm. specifics, and practices. Uh, I'd like to share a couple. Before I do that, I just want to, I'll, I'll stop and ask what I said about local living is, does that make sense? Or are there questions? And, and do you, how do you feel about that? 
Hey, beautiful you, it's Julie. I'm just pausing for a moment because I wanna share in case you don't have this yet, I am gonna encourage you to get your hands on my tool set to design your best life. It is free, here's the copy, and it is pretty darn amazing if I may say so myself. It is a 25 page guidebook. There are seven specific practices, one for each day of the week that are gonna help you really to design your best life, to work on your mindset, on your mindfulness practices, designing your day very specifically. I'll show you here. I have a gorgeous tracking system that is all about how you align your values with how you're spending your time. And there's so much more. There's also a little extra free gift in there. I won't tell you what it is, but definitely make sure you get this for you, for your friends, whomever. It is free. Just go to julieriesler.com slash toolset to get your copy. And would love to hear what is your favorite tool out of the seven? Which one did you resonate most with? Um, there is also an audio track in there as well. I've shared one of my quick grounding meditations. So I hope you pick it up. julieriesler.com slash toolset. It's free. It's for you. I've used these tools with hundreds of clients and my coaching students, and I use them with myself. So I hope they help you to be your USU. All right, back to the show. Oh, absolutely. I I am just, the thing that I wanted to highlight, and then I would love for you to you just keep going, Greg, because the practices I can I can tell will be so helpful. It absolutely makes sense with the localized living. It makes sense on on every level to me. The thing I actually want to highlight that you said that I think is so crucial, and it I don't want this to get overlooked by anybody, is you said it a couple times. The way we win is not by fighting. Yeah. And that that can be uh that can be translated in a lot of ways, meaning what I heard underneath that is you said love fearlessly and putting that into action. I've just, as someone who I've talked a lot about A Course in Miracles, I've been working through that and it's a daily practice on this, right? Getting rid of grievances and judgments and love. And I, I'm like, oh yeah, this is no joke. This starts with ourselves. Stop fighting ourselves. Stop fighting with, uh, like it's, this is this is this goes from micro to macro. So when you said that, I had like goosebumps over my entire body because it's it's uh like you said, have a war that no one shows up to, like a like a like a <laughs> party that no one comes to. So I just wanted to say that that what you just said, there's so much here. That's really that's yeah, that's really big, and that can be a good place for people to start. I think is okay. Yeah. How do I stop? It? Well, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And and just to be really clear, I mean, it it's easy to have these conversations and go to extremes because they are very primal. They touch very primal elements of our being. Yeah. We all know there are times that we have to fight. We all know that. And we've all seen that. And we, World War II and what was happening in Europe, yeah. if we wanted to stop what was happening, we had to to defend what we believed in. But the point is to get to the point where you've got to fight, you've already got to compromise and give in so much of yourself. There are so many places where that war could have been prevented if people had claimed their sovereignty and if they had claimed their divinity. They didn't yeah. do it because they were conditioned not to, Julie. Yeah. And so when it reached the point that it did where all of Europe was threatened with a way of life and with atrocities, we had to fight. And there's a warrior within every one of us. Yeah. You know, we would fight for our loved ones, for our families. We'd fight for our planet if we ever had to do that. So it's not that we never do. What I'm saying is Buckminster Fuller, if you want to to win, to 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 uh to to change the world is what he said, you find a mm -hmm. new way. Now the yeah. science supports everything you just said. Julie, and I know you and I have talked about this in past conversations, and you've had some other people on, I believe, who probably uh, alluded to this. The Institute of Heart Math, the pioneering research center in Northern California that is exploring the human relationship, our relationship to the earth and beyond in non-conventional ways, but they're very, very scientific ways, uh, they now have documented and it's in peer reviewed research. So this isn't hearsay and it's not conspiracy and it's not my theory. This is peer reviewed research. There's a field 
There's an energetic field that underlies all of existence. We've got sensors right now, 40 sensors on different continents through the under the auspices of Princeton University, feeding back to a computer uh, in Southern California, as well as uh, I believe six or seven sensors directly measuring this field, also feeding back to, to the HeartMath uh, central server. And what it tells us very clearly is we can see when there are shifts, when human consciousness uh, shifts, it impacts energetically these fields and the sensors can pick that up, send it back to the computers and, and it can be plotted. If you wanna know more about this, go to the www.heartmath, H-E-A-R-T-M-A-T-H, two words or two, two words put together as one word, heartmath.org and look at the research. So the reason I'm saying this is, is what the research has shown, Julie, is this field, the energetic states of this field, the field only knows one of two energetic states. That's it. It either mm. knows coherence or it knows chaos. That's mm. it. So we can be as well-intentioned as we want when we go, not you and me, but when our community, when they march angrily in the streets, and destroy property and burn buildings, protesting something they feel justified in protesting, you have to ask, what are you feeding the field? Are you feeding the field coherence or are you feeding the field chaos? And the more chaos we put into the field, it actually stimulates greater degrees of the chaos that we say we, we want to heal. So that's the reason that the, that's the scientific reason why anger and hate expressed in violence actually feeds the field, this chaos. And one of the things that we can ask ourselves, I ask myself pretty much every day, Julie, is what am I feeding the field today? Mm. Not to justify how I just ended a conversation with a, a, a publisher or a, a, an event producer halfway around the world that you know, wants me to come and I can't because their borders are closed. I mean, these are things that, that actually happened during the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. I, I had contracts to be somewhere, but the nation wouldn't let me in. And the producer said, not my problem. You have a contract. You have to be here. <laughs> you know, and it was, it was, it was crazy stuff. So I had mm -hmm. to really check myself and say, okay, in this moment, what am I feeding the field? And if I'm feeding the field chaos, don't judge it. You recognize it. You say, okay, yeah, there's some chaos I'm putting in the field. Now, how do I go about shifting that? And, and I'd like to offer uh, something to, to support the answer to that, if, if you're okay with that. Are you okay on time? Are we good on time? Oh, we're, we're doing fantastic. And I was just, you're literally teeing up. I was like, please, Greg, share with us. Because I can hear our, like yeah. I can hear people listening saying, all right, so how do we do that? Absolutely. Well, we, what, one of the things we can do, and I, I won't do it here because we've done it. You and I have done this in the past, and it is in so many videos, is creating the coherence between yeah. the heart and the brain. Heart, brain, coherence, three steps, shift the focus, shift the breath, shift the feelings. It's on my YouTube videos. It's on the HeartMath channel. It's on, it's on Julie's past podcast. So check Julie's past <laughs> podcast with Greg yes. Braden and you'll see it. But sometimes it may not be practical to go into that heart meditation. And when it's not, there are other things that you can do. And so so I like to share practice. I, I do also on a daily basis. And I, I'm going to preface this with a, a discussion of the power of beauty. Uh, beauty has always played a, a very significant role in, in my life. When I left the corporations, I left academia and the corporations uh, after I was the first tech ops manager at Cisco Systems. And I cashed out my stocks and I said, okay, where am I going to live? Am I going to live in another big, beautiful city where everything is really convenient? Or am I going to live somewhere where I wake up in the morning and I am surrounded with the magnificence of nature every single day and the beauty of nature won out? So I actually ended up moving in the middle of nowhere, thinking I would never travel to what used to be a Waldorf school in uh, Northern New Mexico, built in 1888. Uh, it was a fixer upper and it's, it's, <laughs> it's still being fixed up. I mean, you know, almost uh, 40 years later, I'm still fixing it. <laughs> so, 
So the point is, beauty has played a powerful role in my life. And interestingly, here in northern New Mexico, I'm surrounded, we are surrounded by indigenous people. Uh, the Navajo live in the Four Corners area. And to the Navajo, who call themselves Dine, by the way, they don't call themselves Navajo. That's the, the English. Uh, but to the people that live there, they've always called themselves Dine. They've always embraced beauty as more than a peripheral aesthetic. It's more mm -hmm. than something, you know, you see a sunset and you say, okay, that's beautiful. They literally have, have seen beauty as a force of nature mm -hmm. in addition to the four forces of physics that are acknowledged. So physics says we have the electromagnetic force, the force of gravity, the strong and the weak nuclear force. The DNA say, yep, and there's one more. There is a fifth force that is beauty. It, it literally is a force in, in the, the universe, in the cosmos, and we are changed in the presence of beauty. And, and that's true. When we perceive beauty, we are changed biologically in the presence of beauty. Well, in, in the Dine traditions, they, in the ceremony, they actually have a very lengthy beauty prayer, and it's not practical to do on, on this podcast or, you know, uh, in your daily life. However, a, a Dine artist uh, years ago condensed that prayer into three phrases that are very practical. And I, I say these to myself every single day, and I have mm. for decades now. And so what I'd like to do is, is share the beauty prayer. Uh, and by the way, his name is Shanto Bigay. Shanto Bigay, I want to honor him and give him credit, was the uh, Dine artist that first made this available uh, back in the 1980s. The beauty prayer simply, the, the abbreviated version, simply states the beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, the beauty upon which I base my life. Now, those are just words until you understand what they represent. The beauty that I live with invites us, Julie, to embrace the fact that the beauty is already present in all things. We don't have to mm -hmm. make it. Our job is to find it, to seek out the beauty, even in the darkness, even in the, the horrible events, because they are part of God's creation. They're has to be beauty in there somewhere. It may be a, an, a, a minuscule piece of what you're seeing. But Mother Teresa was a master at this. When I had my groups in India, uh, the Sisters of Charity were the hospice organizations, and they would go out at five o'clock in the morning as the sun was rising, and they would search the streets for humans who had been cast out of their homes because they were sick. They were called the untouchables. Mm -hmm. And they were left in the streets to die. And Mother Teresa and the Sisters of Charity would search in Calcutta, in the stench and the dung, in the gutters of the streets. And they would find these humans and they would take them back to the hospice and they would bathe them and put them in white gowns so they could have dignity in their lives for the last moments or hours of their life. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that filth in stench in the streets, Mother Teresa would see a daisy growing out of the dung. And in that daisy, she would find beauty in the horror of those streets. There's always a daisy somewhere in everything. Our job is to find it. And that's a, it's a shift in thinking to know that the beauty is already there. That's different than thinking we have to make it. So yeah. the beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, invites us to allow the beauty that we have recognized to, to be the guideline in our lives, to, to expect beauty in all things, to expect beauty in the worst argument with our intimate partner, to expect the beauty in the, in the disease that is a message to our bodies. Maybe the beauty is, is in us embracing the message. What is our body saying to us? Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty that I live by. The beauty upon which I base my life, I think this maybe is, is perhaps the most powerful. It invites us to allow the beauty to play a, a role more than this peripheral aesthetic. It invites us 
to bring beauty into our lives front and center as the foundation upon which everything in our lives is viewed. It becomes the lens through which we see everything that happens in the world around us. And I, I just have to say, this is one of those mm -hmm. things people have to experience. When we do that, we are changed. Now, the scientists tell us that when we perceive through beauty that we begin to build neural networks that become more sensitive and recognize beauty where it may not have been seen before. We actually develop a way to see beyond the darkness and to see that beauty. So the power of beauty in our lives, how, for me personally, when I see things, doesn't change what happens in the world. What it does, Julie, is empowers me to be more present for what is that's hap happening so that I can make healthy choices and healthy decisions, whether it comes to my personal life, my body, it comes to my business, whether it, it comes to w what I am sharing on a live stage, you know, halfway around the world. So in addition to the coherence, the, the intentional coherence that we can create between our heart and mm -hmm. our brain, beauty also creates coherence uh, and you're not necessarily going through all the steps. It's intuitive. It's an intuitive way of, of creating that coherence. So the beauty, the beauty of everything that we're talking about is there is a scientific and a technological foundation, but we don't have to know any of it. What, what we know is that we are a highly advanced, technologically sophisticated, soft technology. We are not computer chips and AI. We're neurons and cell membranes, and we self-regulate through thought, feeling, emotion, belief, breath, and focus. And that's all we need to know. Our ancestors did it really, really well. You can dive into the tech if you want it, but some people aren't interested in that. They just want to know how to get through the day. And so I'm going to invite our global family that's, that's watching. The millions and millions of people that are watching you right now, I'm going to invite them to invite beauty into their lives. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look right in the camera and I'm going to say, my brothers and sisters, we're going through a tough time, big change in the world, but we're wired for times just like this. If we allow our mm -hmm. bodies to do what our bodies know how to do and our bodies know how to be divine, beauty is a foundation of our divinity. So I'm going to invite you to invite beauty into your life without fear. Don't be afraid to allow beauty to play a powerful, pivotal foundational role in your life. So I wanted to say that we can, we can still talk. I just wanted to say that before we, we lost track, just to kind of complete that thought, Julie. Oh my gosh. I, okay. So I'm going to just take a breath. I am so moved by what you're, what you're saying. And I'm going to invite any, everyone listening just to feel in your body, you know, as you're speaking, Greg, um, it's funny. I did a, Without having the background you do, I did a solo episode a couple months ago and on the power of beauty. And I, I talked about the beauty way prayer that I think you have in, in a couple of your books. And sure. I quoted you and the prayer and I love how you broke it down so that it's, it's, it's not just these words, it's really embodying it. And something that's just coming to heart is understanding even that, that, that concept of divinity to me, the, the the beauty you're talking about, it's like it's the uh, the fingerprint of divinity, and I I just can feel this in my body. I mean, and, and I think valuing, you know, I um like many high achieving type people are like, oh gosh, who has time for this? I gotta like focus and goals, and it's like, no, this is everything. You know, those those goals can be the distraction, the diversion. Yes. And not not that they're not valuable, not that they're not not important, but they if we allow them, they can become a diversion that keeps us from everything yes. we're talking about. Whereas if we embrace everything we're talking about, they will be the stepping stones to those goals. Yeah. That's what I think is important. I, I didn't know we were gonna have this conversation. I don't have my any books in the studio with me and uh, I'm in the studio and actually I'm not in the studio, Julie. I'm on the command deck of the mothership. And I'm, I'm, I, I couldn't find a parking spot outside your studio. So I'm, I'm hovering about uh, 5,000 feet right above where you are right now. So no, I, I, I don't have any books here. So I do have a book entitled The Wisdom Codes. 
Yes, that I goes into a, yeah, it goes into a lot of detail on the power of beauty and the beauty prayer, the full beauty prayer, both in English and in Dine. If you want to say that mm -hmm. prayer using the Dine, it's a vowel-based language. It's very beautiful, very powerful vowel-based language, uh, as well as the abbreviated version that we just shared. So it's it's in the book. Mm -hmm. It's in the audio as well. And I, I speak that audio. So it, uh, you know, we didn't hire somebody else to, to do. Actually, I'll tell you a story. I did that audio uh, in the summer of 2020 when we were having raging fires uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And then, and then the smoke was thick settling down in the valley. And when I went into, it was a musical recording studio to, it's called Step Bridge Studios. Give them a shout out. They're awesome. Awesome brothers. Uh, when I went in, we had to sit there and let the air just be in the presence of purified air and let it clear from, I had to let it clear from my body before my voice was good enough to do that recording. And there are a couple of places in the recording where it may sound like I, I was still uh, in the presence of that smoke, but it was very powerful to, to do the audio version of the book while those fires were raging day and night all around us on three, three sides. Very intense, very intense time. Julie, I, I want to ask, how often do you do you do this? How often do you interview for a podcast? I, um, and by the way, I want to say that the wisdom, this is one of my favorite gifts to give people. In fact, I have them downstairs in a little stack and I'm laughing because I didn't, I didn't even bring anything when, when I did this, I was like, we're just gonna, we're gonna fly with our intuition. And I'm, I will, uh, we'll make sure to have links to everything. Your books are just, they're stunning. They're, they're next level. They're, they're, they're with the science. With the, I mean, you, you are the full, you know, enlightened. I know you're human. And you just, you have it all and it. And your books really, uh, they're, they're heart opening, they're mind opening. So I just want to say, mm. it's my favorite thing to give is that book actually. It's um, good for me. What you don't know is it's good for me to hear that today. Thank you very much, Julie. I, yes, I appreciate that. True, true story. You, I'm serious in my little gift area. It's like, that's what I have. <laughs> Are your books? I don't even give my books. I give yours because it's like they're so. It's so good. It's so good. Um, I do. We release every month, uh, every week, uh, a okay. new episode every week. But I interview a couple times a week, and I really go by my intuition and what you're talking about. You know, coming on the edge of after COVID and a lot of shifts and globally, and we could go into. I mean, you you touched upon them. Um, this this claiming your sovereignty, this, uh, making sure that everyone listening is, 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 is shoring up their soul compass is living with love. I mean, what you're talking about, this is this to me, this is how we are going to change ourselves in our world. And, um, so I try to bring as many voices that support this. Honestly, you said it embracing your divinity. I was like, I can't believe I've never thought of those words, but that's it. That's what we're I'm trying to do here. And, um, yeah, so that's, this is, this feels so important to me. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you for a, a beautiful conversation about beauty <laughs> and for, for your trust it. again with, uh, with your community and my family as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's been a while since we did this. Let's, let's do the more frequently. Let's do another one. Let's do Greg and Julie part two. Sure. You have a standing invitation, Greg. I mean it. I would mm. bring you every month if you want to bring you as often as you're around in the in your mothership in the space to be able to record. <laughs> I'm, this yeah, I'm, I'm in now the country quite a bit over the uh, through yeah. the end of the year, but beginning next year, uh, yeah. let's have that conversation. Okay. I think so, especially I don't know astrology probably as well as you do, but I know there's some big changes coming astrologically. I know Pluto. I don't and, know. I don't know much about astrology. I just know my gut feels it. It feels like we're yeah. in for not bad things or even yeah. good things, but big yeah. things, big changes, big, big changes in the world, and that that means big changes in our lives. And hmm. you know, I think this is the thing we we've been led to believe we live in a static world. And mm. that when something changes, it means something's wrong or something's broken. And I, I think we're all finding that simply is not true. We live mm. in a very dynamic system. Nature is dynamic. Uh, life is dynamic. And I think we're going to see examples of that over the next few months and certainly into mm. to this, this new year. 
Uh, and I, I'm optimistic because I know what's possible for us on the other side. I'm also a realist. Realistically, we're in it. The only way out of it is to go through it. And I believe mm -hmm. that when we embrace our divinity, it gives us the ability to come in for a soft landing on the changes that must happen because mm -hmm. the, the system is unsustainable the way it is. All the systems are unsustainable the way they are right now. And I think we all, it's, I'm not saying anything people don't already know. We all feel it. Yeah. So, uh, so let's come in for a soft landing in the new world. Well, I am with you on that. <laughs> yes. To the soft landing. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. And I, I always, I think this, you just shared this, but I always give the, your heart, the last, the last, uh, mic, if there's, I call them heart flares. If there's any last thing that your heart's like, you know, I just want to say this. So if you have any heart flares, Greg, you know, I just, yeah. I want to thank people. First, I want to say, uh, everyone watching this, I love you and I don't know you, but I love you for who you are. And I love you. I love you for being the best version of yourself in the world that we find ourselves in so that we can create the best world possible. And, uh, and we're in this together. I just want everybody to know we're all in this together and, and we're wired. We're wired for this. We're made for this time. So let's, uh, let's allow our hearts and our minds to do what our hearts and minds know how to do. And let's do it really well together. Uh oh, and so it uh -oh. is. My gosh, my heart to yours, Greg. Holy moly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the beauty of you, your wisdom, your just, there's so much here. I, I can't even say in enough words how thankful I am. And I know anybody and everybody listening now and in, into the, into the eternity of time, seriously, this is just, this is a, uh, a conversation. Um, I hope everyone really takes to heart because we all have the ability, as you said, we have the ability to, we have divinity, we have our soul compass. We have this ability to reconnect at a very deep level to who we really are. It's beautiful. Well, Julie, I want to thank you for yeah. the community that you built around your work, your life, and this podcast. And we need you. We appreciate you. And I look forward to our mm -hmm. next. Likewise. And I'll just say thank you to our beloved listeners. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. Thank you for being here and really, really doing your part to love and honor your USG and to see the beauty that is within you. Love and light. My friend, I'm so grateful and honored to be here with you on your journey and being your USU. Thank you for watching this episode, for being part of this incredible community and this mission to really step into your light to your highest purpose. I believe that as we all do that, we all can really be our best selves and uplift consciousness and in humanity. So thank you. I also wanted to say that if you are looking for greater support right now, maybe you're having a health concern or you're looking to really step into that next version, best version of yourself, please come connect with me, whether it's for more resources or coaching or guidance. I would love to support you in any way that I can. Just go to julieresler.com. You can book a powerful one-on-one -on -one breakthrough session there. You can connect with me. I would love to meet you. I'd love to hear how I can be on this journey with you. And before I forget, if you'd like a little more of this good vibe uh, tribe and would like to digest these episodes with a high vibe community, just go to Facebook and look up the USU podcast community. You'll find us there. Love always. And thank you so much for taking the time and energy to truly stepping into your authenticity and being your USU.